these news events, there's neuroscience seminar events, uh, which are being hosted, for those of you who don't know, uh, hosted by uh, the Pakistan Neuroscience Society. And this is the second of these, and we're planning to run these every month on the first Wednesday of every month at this time, unless for any other reason, uh, we have to change the time, but generally we'll try and keep it to these times. And the plan is to have session speakers from across the world. And so the timings may be a little bit different just based on that, but we hope to have speakers from all across the world um, covering a huge range of neuroscience topics. And today's topic is going to be really interesting, exciting, especially for those of us who are, let's say, more mature and are worried about our um, <clears throat> aging brains and whether we can get neurogenesis or not in our aging brains. But I'll leave that for others to talk about. So basically what I want to do is just welcome everybody, say to everybody that what we'd like these presentations to be is to be as interactive as possible. So we want the audience to get involved. So once the speaker is finished their presentation, during the presentation, please feel free to put questions into the chat because it's very useful if you're thinking about something along while the, while the presentation is happening. It is useful just to put that into the chat because other people can see those questions as well. It might spark questions in them as well. So it's always a good idea to put things in the chat and we can then ask you, um, if you want to ask a question personally yourself, you can ask a question at the end of the seminar or somebody can ask it on your behalf as well. Or if there's any questions that you have, you're saving them till the end of the presentation, that's fine as well. I'm sure our speaker will be more than happy to be engaged as possible and try and answer all your questions. The plan is to have a session for about 40 minutes or so, and then about 20 minutes of questions directly related to the seminar. And then after that, that can spill over um, into questions which may be a little bit more general, might not be specifically related to the seminar, but perhaps a little bit more general about uh, things like careers, about things like how the speaker, for example, has got to the position that they've got to, some of the you know, perhaps obstacles they've had along the way, some of the highlights along the way, what is the career um, perspectives and what kind of perspectives can they give us on their career and research in neuroscience. So those are the kind of questions we thought would be really useful for uh, the younger faculty, especially um, who are here listening to the presentation to try and get some insight into. And the insights will be very different depending on who the speaker is and where they are in the world as well. So that's a great thing as well to be able to get insight from people from all over the world. So that's the kind of thing that we're trying to, hoping to achieve in these seminars, as well as getting some great science uh, being spread across from all corners of the world to also get some insight into people and their careers and how they got to where they got to. Because that's always a very useful exercise and that's a learning, important learning curve as well. So I've probably said more than enough. I've taken up five minutes of your time. I'm gonna stop there. And I'm now gonna hand over to Salah Ahmed, who's gonna actually do the introduction for our speaker today. So thank you, Salah. To, to all our guests, speakers, and everyone watching, it is my distinct honor and privilege to welcome you all to another exciting session of Neuroscience Educational Webinar Series organized by Pakistan Society of Basic and Applied Neuroscience, PASPAN. I am Salah Ahmed, and I am currently a medical student at the Aga Khan University and a core member of the Neuroscience Interest Group. The webinar today will begin with a 45-minute presentation, followed by a 15-minute question and answer session and a 20 minute general discussion. If you have a question, you're encouraged and requested to raise your hands on Zoom and unmute yourself only when I call out your name. You are requested to also turn on your videos to make this webinar more interactive. You can alternatively send in your questions in the chat box as well. Feel free to circulate the link of this session among your colleagues who might be interested in joining. I'd like to emphasize that for certificates, it is essential to fill out the feedback form whose link will be shared at the end of the session in the chat box and on your screens. We have with us today many brilliant minds joining us from Pakistan and around the globe, hopefully. We are joined by our director of the neuroscience webinar series, Professor Dr. Zafar Bashir. You guys have met him, Abhi. Paswan's founding president and N6 patron, Dr. Atharinam Sitara Imtiaz, and our esteemed speaker, Dr. Mariela Trinchero, that I have the honor of introducing. 
Dr. Chunchero studied biochemistry at the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. At the age of 21, she joined the Department of Human Physiopathology, where she studied the modulation of noradrenergic nervous system by neurotrophins in the hypothalamus. Then she became interested in investigating the role of environmental enrichment in depression at the Institute of Pharmacological Studies of Buenos Aires. In 2007, she joined Alejandro Skinder's lab at Leloa Institute and Dra Arbo's lab in France to develop her doctoral thesis, digging the impact of learning on adult neurogenesis. Currently, she's an assistant researcher of the Argentine Research Council at Schindler's lab, where she studies neurogenesis in the aging brain. Dr. Mariella, we are so honored to have you here with us. And let me start by thanking you for your time for this reason. It's truly remarkable how much you have achieved and contributed to the field of neuroscience at such a young age. I'm sure me along with the attendees over here are really looking forward to your presentation. So over to you. Great, can, okay. I, just, can I just chip in something? So I, I, I met yeah. Mariala in one of this Corpus Curiosum thing, right? And I was jo just so impressed uh, interacting with her. Uh, the brilliance was just like exuding everywhere when you talked, when, when I discussed with her. So it was, I always wanted her to be one of the speakers and we got the opportunity to bring you in early on. So it's, it's a pleasure. Please go ahead now. Okay, thank you so much. You're all very, very kind. Um, so can you tell me if you can see the screen? Yes, yes. Sure. we can. Okay. Um, so yeah, first of all, I wanted to thank uh, Professor Inam for uh, inviting me to give this talk, um, Professor Bashir and all the new team. Uh, you have been amazing and I'm super happy to be here. So uh, the title for today's talk is a Generation of New Neurons in the, in the Adult and Asian Brain. Uh, but first I want to emphasize uh, the term super happy because um, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm getting older and nostalgic, but I mean, we can connect even though I am right here in really in the South and you are all the way here. So I think that's pretty amazing. And of course, unfortunately, because of COVID, we cannot uh, get together uh, via a plane like this, but we can get together because of neuroscience, right? So that, that is really a nice thing. And because I know there are very uh, young people and um, the idea of these seminars is to encourage neuroscience, I thought I would take uh, just a few minutes to, to tell you why I got interested in, in, in this field. So why uh, neuroscience? Uh, well, I think that uh, even being uh, really uh, young, as an even little girl, I was fascinated by the fact that um, thanks to the brain, we can do really uh, complex tasks like, like like dancing, like you can hear music and then moving accordingly. Uh, some people better than others, of course, but anyway. Um, uh, there are even more complex uh, things that you can do, like playing an instrument. And this one is uh, Marta Kerich. If you don't know her, she's an amazing Argentinian piano player. And uh, she's 80 years old, and she can remember thousands of notes and then uh, play along with the orchestra. And this is, of course, because of uh, her amazing brain, right? And yeah, you can also be creative. And of course, uh, we are able to think and form memories uh, because of the brain. And these are just some examples that have inspired me. Um, they are because uh, I feel really close to them, but you can imagine thousands of things that we can do thanks to the brain. And for me, what is mind blowing is, is that we can do all of these things because at the end of the day, there are neurons firing action potentials, right? I mean, it's not that simple, but yeah, finally it, it's just that. Um, so yeah, really early in my life, I, I, I really was sure that I would uh, study how the brain works because, as you know, it's kind of a black box and it's not so clear. 
But because uh, of this complexity um, with the brain being so, so difficult to study, when you pursue a career in neuroscience, of course, you have to focus. Uh, you cannot study the whole brain. Unfortunately, I wish I could. Uh, and uh, for me, really early, I uh, started university in Mexico campus. So here I show you a scheme of the human head, uh, which you can, of course, recognize. And I show you here, depicted in red, uh, the hippocampus. Of course, we have both, uh, both each one in uh, each hemisphere. And the interesting uh, functions that the hippocampus has uh, are uh, um, related to forming memories, uh, episodic memory in particular, which uh, has to do with uh, uh, remembering events that happened to you and that could answer to the questions when, where, and what. So you can remember, for instance, what you did uh, last weekend because you have a, uh, the hippocampus. And uh, I don't know if you remember or you have heard that in 2014, uh, the Mossers and Opif uh, received the Nobel Prize uh, for describing that uh, part of the GPS of the brain is uh, actually in the hippocampus, so it is involved in a special cognition. But what brings us today uh, to this uh, seminar is that the hippocampus has the amazing ability to form neurons throughout uh, life until, uh, until, the, until death, right? So uh, this means that, as you can see by its functions and its properties, that the hippocampus is really highly plastic. So that, for me, called my attention, and I decided, okay, I will, I will study this area. Um, regarding other neurogenesis, uh, I don't know about you because uh, I think you are all super young, but me, I grew up uh, thinking that uh, we were born with a certain amount of neurons and they we died with the same amount of neurons, meaning there was no uh, regeneration. Um, this is because, uh, and I will introduce you here to Ramon Cajal, he established uh, the central dogma of neurobiology, claiming that in the adult uh, centers, the nerve paths are something fixed, ended, and immutable, that everything may die and nothing may be regenerated. Because uh, that that was the belief at, at the time. But as you probably know, and he knew also, uh, science changes every day, right? So you, you have new discoveries and this could change. So he was very humble uh, at that point. And he also said that it is for the science of the future to change, if possible, this harsh degree. So because of uh, time issues, I cannot get a lot into the history of Adal neurogenesis, which is really, uh, Interesting for me, of course, but I might be a bit biased, of course. Uh, but I will tell you that a neurogenesis is a process that is on And you can see here that I put a lot of animals in which uh, a neurogenesis has been studied. And also, there is evidence that uh, this is the case also for the human uh, hippocampus. But of course, in the lab, uh, we need to focus on one model and we need a tool to study other neurogenesis. And in our case, we take advantage of uh, mouse models. So uh, in mice, uh, there are two restrictive zones where uh, adult neurogenesis takes place. Uh, one of it is the subventricular zone, which is here in purple. And you have here a uh, neuroprogenitor cells that give rise to neuroblasts that will migrate through the dorsal migratory stream and then integrate into the olfactory bulb as interneurons. Uh, and then you have in the hippocampus this area in green called the, the subgranular zone, uh, in which you also have neuroprogenitor cells, but in this case, they will uh, give rise to dentate granule cells. So in the lab, uh, we focus in the hippocampus. And in order to understand other neurogenesis in the hippocampus, we need to talk a little bit about the, um, yeah, the functional structure, how it is uh, made of. And uh, here you can see a scheme um, in which I show you the hippocampus organization, you can see that this uh, banana shaped structure. And if you take a coronal section, you can uh, 
see this insert here. And you see uh, that there are three uh, layers of glutamatergic neurons that conform the basic configuration of the hippocampus. And uh, this forms uh, the trisynaptic hippocampal pathway, which goes like this. So uh, the terminal cortex brings information uh, coming from sensory inputs uh, towards the dentatorius, to the granule cells that are the principal cells of the dentatorius, here uh, depicted in green. And then dental granule cells uh, send information to pyramidal cells in CA3. CA3 send it to CA1. And then CA1 uh, sends the information back to the enterinal cortex in order to close, close the loop. Uh, so, okay, so you might think, okay, this is really simple. You can remember it, okay, that, that's good. But actually, it's not that simple. This is a really simplistic view. And it is not simple uh, if you take into account that there is also uh, the, the hippocampus is filled with gabaragic interneurons, uh, which impose an inhibitory tone all the time. So it's not just these uh, glutamatergic uh, neurons I am showing you here, but also the inhibitory neurons. And also uh, the hippocampus receives input from other regions, even long range. Uh, region. So it's not like this is the trisynaptic hippocampal pathway and that's it and it is disconnected from the brain. And of course, if you think about today's topic, which is uh, galerogenesis, and you are uh, start thinking, okay, so here in the shyus, uh, uh, new neurons are being added continuously to our life, then you might think, okay, this for sure will change the way in which the hippocampus is processing information because you are adding new neurons. And also not only the new neurons, but you have de developing neurons all the time. So this is a, like a rare feature that makes the hippocampus super interesting. What well, at least for me. And um, so uh, what do they, these neurons uh, do? Um, well, uh, I have a spoiler alert, we still don't know really what, what they do, but there are some experiments that uh, when you ablate in neurogenesis, uh, animals have problems with a special memory. And the other uh, topic that has been studied uh, recently and a hypothesis that is uh, gaining a lot of uh, strength is that uh, other neurogenesis is involved in pattern separation. So pattern separation means that you receive uh, two stimuli, like here, A and A prime, and you decide that these uh, two stimuli are different. So you're, thanks to other neurogenesis, it is thought that you are able to discriminate to similar inputs, okay? Uh, but I think this is uh, still an open topic and we, there is no final work on it. Uh, in the lab, uh, we have a few tools that I want to explain and share with you. Uh, we have this ASCL1 um, uh, clock stop tomato mice. I don't expect you to, to remember this, uh, the name of this animal. But uh, basically what it happens is that when you inject tamoxifen, all the progenitor uh, cells uh, expressing ASCL1 will uh, start expressing the reporter tomato, which of course you see in red. And uh, in that way, you can follow uh, other neurogenesis and uh, study all the neurons in terms of electrophysiology or morphology or whatever you want. So let me tell you a little bit about this uh, image. Uh, so we have in blue new when, which is a neuronal marker. So you can see the three layers that I talked to you uh, about, the dentichiru, CA3, and CA1. And then in red, you have these uh, beautiful new neurons that were born during the adulthood of this uh, mouse. So this is the dentichirus, but uh, in the dentichirus, there is like a restricted zone, which is called the subgranular zone, which is here. Uh, in which the progenitor cells reside and divide uh, to these uh, new cells that way we integrate into the granule cell layer. Okay, so here we have a beautiful, uh, mature looking uh, neuron that, that uh, projects its dendrites towards the molecular layer. 
And the dendrites of these neurons are like the input cable. So uh, through these dendrites, this neuron will receive the information from the entorinal cortex, as I told you before. And the way it, this happens is uh, by the absence of the entorinal cortex getting uh, close to these uh, specialized uh, little um, dendritic spines, which you can see here. And this uh, connectivity is uh, glutamatergic and excitatory. Uh, but of course, as you have an input cable, you need an output cable, which is this uh, tiny little axon here. And the reason why it, uh, you see it like this is because actually the axon is thinner than the gen, right? So uh, it's a bit harder to see, but you can see that these uh, axons from the granular cells go through the hilus all the way to CA3 to deliver the information that it got from the entorinal cortex. And then, as you probably already know and remember, CA3 sends the information to CA1 and CA1 closes, closes the loop to uh, the entorinal cortex. So another way we have in the lab uh, to uh, label the, the neurogenesis is of uh, retrovirus. So, uh, we use uh, stereotactical injections that we uh, do in the dentechirus using uh, retroviruses expressing the green fluorescent protein or even you can put whatever you want you can put uh, channel rhodopsin you can put uh, a lot of things and the retrovirus will infect only the cells that are dividing at the moment of the injection so when you do this and the progenitor cells divide you get all the neurons labeled in green and expressing whatever you want it to express. So in this way, you are able to do electrophysiological recordings and confocal microscopy as you can do with the ASCL1 uh, animal. So in this way, uh, we have been able to describe, describe how, how these neurons develop. And you can see here that they look really immature at first but then they start projecting the then rise towards the molecular layer. And it is here where this neuron will receive the inputs coming from the entorinal cortex. So this continues to happen until uh, the dendritic tree uh, is completely uh, mature looking like these neurons. And you could also see if you pay a lot of attention that these dendrites have a lot of dendritic spines on it. So um, thanks to these uh, techniques, uh, our lab and others, other labs in the world, uh, have been able to describe how is the development of these neurons from the start to uh, a mature and integrated uh, neuron. And at first, in the first stages, uh, these neurons express uh, immature markers, uh, such as our recording, and then this expression goes down and then calvindin expression goes up, uh, which is a mature uh, neuronal marker. And these are just examples, but you have other markers that you, you can use. In terms of uh, their connectivity, there are several features that are really interesting. Uh, the first one is that the first input that these neurons receive are uh, GABAergic dendritic uh, inputs, which at first will be excitatory which is weird because GABA, you know, as an inhibitory and neurotransmitter, but at first it will be excitatory because of uh, a change uh, in the chloride concentration of the neuron. Then this will change and the GABA eventually becomes inhibitory, like uh, with all the, uh, all the neurons. And uh, this neuron will also start receiving uh, glutamat glutamatergic inputs from the entorinal cortex through the dendritic spines, which you already know because you, you pay a lot of attention. <laughs> uh, and then uh, at four weeks, something really interesting happens. So because this neuron started receiving a lot of glutamatergic inputs, but the glutamatergic inputs, uh, it's a bit restrained at this point. Uh, the excitation inhibition uh, ratio uh, is uh, high. So these neurons, uh, that have a four weeks old are really plastic and really excitable. So if you think back to the slide where I show you the whole circuit, you might think that the, 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 the idea that these neurons are there in the circuit, but they are more excitable 
and more uh, plastic uh, for sure will change the way in, the, in, in which the hippocampus pro process the information. So uh, at the final stage, uh, these neurons receive uh, perisomatic inhibition, which is the, the last part of uh, maturation, and the whole thing uh, takes about eight weeks to, to happen. So, okay, at this point, uh, you could think that this is a static process, and okay, this happens, happens in eight weeks, but guess what? It's not, because nothing is uh, simple in uh, neuroscience. And uh, actually, you can modulate uh, the rate of maturation of these uh, neurons. And here I will show you two examples. The first one is, uh, I show you here, a control um, neuron that is uh, 21 days old. So it's kind of here. You can see the dendritic tree. Uh, and uh, the length is approximately 400 microns. But if the, if the animals run for 21 days, you can see that not only you have more neurons, but the dendritic uh, tree length increased by 50%. So uh, you, in this way, are accelerating the neuronal development. Uh, a similar experiment uh, that uh, Diego Alvarez and Damiana Giacomini in the lab did was to expose animals to a brief period of enriched environment, which I will show you later how we do it. And uh, they also saw that with only a few days during a critical uh, period here uh, in the early stages of neural development, you can also increase the dendritic uh, tree. And uh, for sure, this neuron is more connected with this one. Um, so, I am showing you here uh, changes in the morphology of these neurons, but uh, we know because of uh, work from other uh, labs in the world that there are several factors that can uh, either increase or decrease the amount of neurons, not only the quality. So it is known that physical exercise and rich environment and learning increase the uh, amount of new neurons being generated and also pathological factors such as epilepsy, in which adenogenesis is a bit aberrant, it's not, it's not like a normal uh, neurogenesis. Um, but it also uh, happens that uh, there are physiological factors uh, such as aging, which no one escapes from, <laughs> that decreases the amount of neurons that are being generated, and also pathological factors such as depression, stress, and Alzheimer's disease, which also can decrease um, the generation of minerals. So at this point, um, uh, when I was uh, late in my PhD and started my postdoc, uh, we decided to study uh, aging because we knew that the amount of neurons being generated is, is smaller, but we didn't know what is the quality of these neurons generated in the aging hippocampus. And also, it is like a general belief, uh, maybe, that uh, once you get a bit older, there is no plasticity with the brain. Like, if you are not a kid, you will never learn something in your life and, uh, and so on, right? So that's a kind of a second dogma. Uh, so we try to assess uh, whether these neurons conserve any kind of plasticity. So, uh, to answer these questions, uh, we use again the retroviral labeling, labeling on confocal imaging, imaging. And I show you here how we do it. We take a lot of confocal planes of the neuron, and then we are able to project them in a three way uh, fashion. And we get these uh, beautiful projecting uh, neurons. Uh, of course, they are beautiful to me. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, and then um, we are also interested in measuring the dendritic tree lens in order to have a quantitative parameter, right, to compare. And because we know that the dendritic spines uh, correlate with the connectivity of these neurons, we also take these uh, high-resolution pictures that I show you here, and you can uh, quantify the amount of uh, dendritic spines that you have uh, in a certain uh, dendrite fra dendritic fragment. So in this way, we have a kind of idea whether this neuron could be integrating into the system. Uh, so uh, using that, uh, those techniques, um, 
we checked it out uh, from this in animals, but they have different ages. Uh, we had a uh, two-month-old animals, five-month-old and eight-month-old, which are a middle-aged uh, mice. So then we uh, sacrifice animals at different time points in order to study the development of adenogenesis in all the ages of the animal. So first, I will focus on uh, 21 days post-injection. And uh, I show you here a picture where you see that uh, in young animals, you have, as I showed you before, a beautiful dendritic tree uh, looking but pretty uh, mature. But then as mice get old, you can see that on, not only the, the number of minions uh, generating uh, decreases, but also when you look at this uh, middle-aged animal, you can see that this neuron has uh, a few features that are uh, comparable with immature neurons. So remember that these uh, neurons are the same age, right? The only difference is that they were born in older animals. So here you can see <coughs> uh, these processes that you cannot really tell if they are the axon or the dendrite or what, and this is really uh, an immature feature of these neurons. You can also see that this uh, dendrite does not reach the molecular layer. And if you recall, it is here where they receive the input from the neutrinal cortex. So you might think that this neuron is not connected, right? But for that, we can uh, look at the dendritic spines. And actually, we found that this is the case because uh, eight month old animals uh, show that uh, these uh, 21 dpi neurons have no dendritic spines. So it makes sense because they are not reaching the molecular layer. So we could say that aging delays morphological maturation, especially during the first weeks. And I say this because uh, we did continue doing the curve and uh, it takes a little longer, but these uh, neurons do reach uh, maturation completely, okay? But it takes longer for them. And again, because of our time issues, I cannot show you, show you all the experiments we did, but uh, believe me, and you can go to the reference here, that this uh, delay in morphological maturation is supported by low local activity, which is really important for the hippocampus, and also diminish levels of uh, neurotrophic factors that are like fertilizers for the neuron, right? The neuron uh, needs these uh, neurotrophic factors uh, in order to grow, to survive. So because we know that uh, these features uh, and activity is so important uh, for the hippocampus, we decided to uh, modulate this activity through uh, a stimuli we knew that uh, increased uh, hippocampal activity, such as physical exercise and enriched environment. So at first, uh, we decided to study, to study physical exercise. So to study the effect of physical exercise on these neurons, we injected uh, our friend, the retrovirus expressing GFP in eight-month-old animals, and we waited 21 days. But then a set of uh, animals, uh, we exposed them to a running wheel. And you might not believe me, but these animals run a lot. Like they, they can run like five or eight kilometers a night. So that, yeah, that blew my mind. I, I didn't expect that. And it made me look really lazy, right? Uh, so you have here a sedentary animal. And as I showed you before, uh, 21 day old neurons, uh, they don't look uh, really mature. Uh, their dendritic uh, tree is really short and yeah. The, this, uh, this is a feature that uh, we see in immature neurons. But when we saw running animals, we found this amazing difference in the phenotype of these neurons. And just as a remind, man, reminder, I will show you how a mature neuron born in a young mouse looks like. So as you can see, these neurons look pretty much the same, right? So they look really mature. Uh, so you can see the quantification here. And you see that the dendritic tree length goes from uh, like 100 microns to uh, 500 microns. So this is highly significant difference. Um, 
because we are interested also in the connectivity of these cells, we thought to uh, study a little bit the lymphatic spines. And in the same experiment, we look at, uh, at the shaft of the dendrite, uh, and as we the new control neurons look like this, they don't have any uh, spines at all. But then running animals uh, were covered um, with the lymphatic spines in their dendrite. And also what really call our attention is that uh, the amount of uh, dendritic spines uh, was even higher than the one you find in the same uh, age of the neuron, but in a young mice. So uh, this was really an all or nothing situation, as you can see here. So these neurons, remember, they are the same age. So the only difference is that this animal ran and this animal didn't. So uh, Unfortunately, I hate running, but maybe you could run and I think it will be good for your brain. Uh, so basically, yeah, we, we proved that running accelerates neuronal maturation in the Asian hippocampus. So what about enrich environment? Um, what, what is enrich environment, right? Uh, so here I brought you a little video uh, showing you uh, that we use a larger cage uh, for the animals to explore and we put toys and tunnels and they love uh, sniffing everything and going through the tunnels and also they have like a cute little house where they live rent free so they are really happy there and um, we uh, did kind of a same um, protocol we injected the retrovirus in these uh, Asian animals and we waited uh, 21 days but in this case, because I showed you before that in young animals, there are a brief periods of enriched environment that also, also accelerates neural maturation. We uh, wonder if these uh, neurons being born in an Asian animal are plastic enough to respond to these uh, brief uh, periods of uh, stimuli. So we also decided to take uh, these short windows of seven days from zero to seven, seven to 14 and 14 to 21. And remember, keep in mind that we always study 21 uh, days post-injection neurons. So as it happened with enrich environment, we saw that, uh, sorry, with running, we saw that also with enrich environment, there was an increase in the dendritic tree length and also in the amount of uh, dendritic spines we see in their dendrites. And what about the periods? Well, we found a critical period uh, from 7 to 14 days, in which if you expose animals uh, in this moment of the um, development of the neuron, you can see that there is an increase in the dendritic uh, tree length and also in the spine density. So you might think that uh, these neurons are more connected. So uh, now I would like to make a little stop and um, say that uh, at this point I'm saying a lot that you might think that these neurons are connected. And why am I being so careful about this? Because when you do science, you have to be very accurate with what you say. And uh, having a spines and being more connected is only a correlation, right? You have to actually uh, put this hypothesis uh, on test and really try. And for that, uh, morphology is not enough. And uh, you have to um, ask yourself, how do we know if these neurons are really connected? For that, we need to do uh, experiments that are a little more, more difficult, uh, which is uh, ex vivo electrophysiology. Uh, but I assure you, uh, this is an amazing technique. I really love it. It's really cool. And I will ask you, please, uh, don't panic. So I, I will try to ease you the way into the electrophysiological recording so that uh, you love it the way that I do. Um, so first we need a brain, right? Uh, and because you're probably about to have dinner, I will show you the part where you take the, the brain out of the mouse. But uh, yeah, you have, uh, voila, you have the brain here, and then you put it uh, here in this little chamber that will go into the vibratum. And then uh, using this vibratum, you are able to get uh, a slices of the brain, which are, uh, yeah, here it's, uh, it says uh, 350, but usually we can use also 400 uh, in order to keep the connectivity. 
So here you have uh, these beautiful uh, light slices that we keep in artificial cerebrospinal fluid. And you can see here an insert of the, of the slice. And uh, you can see here, well, you cannot see it, but uh, I promise you that here is the gyrus. So when you are about to record, uh, you want to go to, to this area of the slice. Um, so here uh, you place uh, the slice in the microscope and uh, you first you need to find the one uh, like like in life but yeah with the neurons right so you need to find uh, to see if the slice is healthy if the neurons are alive and uh, here I show you a video of uh, the slice and how we see it in the setup and you can see that uh, I put it again because they are so beautiful. Uh, they are really alive, they are, they are round, and this uh, means that you will have a good day of electrophysiological recordings. Um, so to do uh, this technique, uh, you need a glass pipette, uh, and I show you here a little uh, video, which is, uh, I'm not that fast, this is accelerated. And uh, you put a, a glass pipette here, but we need uh, the tip of the pipette to be really thin in order to touch the cell. So we do this uh, two-step technique with the puller, uh, and we hit the, the middle part uh, so that we get uh, a pipette looking like this, right? So here you have two out of one. And um, with this pipette, we will uh, do the patch clamp technique, which you might have heard. So you approach the pipette to your neuron, and then you establish a giga seal. And after that, you apply suction with this uh, amazing apparatus, which is only a syringe. And uh, you have to apply suction with your mouth. So it's not uh, COVID friendly right now, but yeah, it's the way to do it. And then you uh, break this uh, part of the membrane in order for the inside of the pipette to fill the neuron. And that is why the conf this configuration is called whole cell. And I explained whole cell to you because it's the thing that, that, that I use. But there are other configurations for patch clamp that you can use depending on what you want to address. So yeah, these experiments I really uh, like. Uh, and how do you approach the neurons? Well, you have to do it really gently. And for that, you use this micro manipulator. Uh, you run this uh, wheel really fast and the pipette moves really slow. So this enables you to touch the, the neuron really softly. You are controlling it uh, here with the holder. And then uh, you have to actually, and this is maybe the hardest part, uh, you have to touch the cell and then apply the pressure and uh, then you are into the cell, uh, which you can see here because in this case I filled the pipette with a uh, fluorescent dye and you can see that you are in the cell because the fluorescent dye is also filling the cell, right? So this is the meaning of whole cell. Um, there are several features that you can study uh, with electrophysiology, but I will tell you uh, now about two of them because of time and because I don't want you to get bored. But uh, yeah, you basically have a, a granule cell here. And uh, usually this, uh, the, the resting potential is at minus 17 volts approximately. But if these neurons get uh, stimulated enough, uh, they can increase uh, the membrane potential because of the incoming of uh, sodium. And uh, then uh, when they are at the top of this uh, um, membrane potential, then uh, sodium channels close, potassium channel opens, potassium goes out, and this uh, uh, makes the neuron go back to the uh, hyperpolarized uh, potential. So this that I told you here is basically the action potential, right? And um, when we have these cells in our uh, pipette, we can ask them whether they can fire action potentials or not. So we give them current and we say, okay, can you spike? Yes or no? And as you can see, the neuron is able to spike several action potentials. 
because it is mature, but maybe if it was immature, it wouldn't be able, right? So it's a way uh, to address this intrinsic property of the neurons of fire and actually, uh, yeah, fire and action potential. But uh, the other thing that I told you we are really interested in is the connectivity. So we have again our friend the neuron, and then we have the presynaptic axon coming from the neuronal cortex. And when this axon releases the neurotransmitter, uh, the neurotransmitter binds to the receptors on the other part, which is the neuron that we are recording, right? Through the dendritic spine. And this open ion channels, and that implies current, right? So this current you can uh, study, and in this case, uh, I'm showing you excitatory postsynaptic current, and you can see that every uh, deflection of the baseline means that uh, some uh, neurotransmitter uh, was binding to the receptor of ion neuron, meaning that it's actually connected. So this is the way that you prove that the neurons are really connected. So back to the question and um, what we wanted to find out, uh, we use the ASCL1 uh, tomatomize and uh, injected tamoxifen uh, so that we could label uh, born neurons in eight months old animals, which are our middle, middle aged animals. And then we expose these animals uh, from day seven to 14. Uh, to an enriched environment because we know that this is the critical period and that we know that neurons will respond, but we want to know if they are uh, electrophysiologically mature and if they are connected and so on, apart from the morphological features. So we did some whole recordings and uh, in terms of uh, spiking, you can see that the control neuron uh, is not able to fire an action potential. And actually, this makes a lot of sense if you take into account that it looks like this, right? So it's not very promising, this situation. But uh, these uh, neurons exposed to a rich environment from day, day 7 to day 14 can actually fire a lot of action potential, which you can see here quantified. In terms of uh, connectivity, we assess, again, the excitatory postsynaptic currents and, well, the control you don't see any deflections, which again makes sense uh, because these neurons, they have no dendritic spine. So why would they be connected, right? But then animals who were exposed, who, uh, their uh, neurons have a dendritic spines, you can see deflection. And then we could quantify the, the frequency of these excitatory postsynaptic currents. And you also see that it is a kind of all or nothing situation, right? So uh, basically, yeah, seven days of enriched exposure accelerating neural integration in the Asian hippocampus. So as I show you, I think we broke down the dogma that there is no plasticity uh, in the Asian brain, right? Uh, so the basic conclusion is that in the Asian hippocampus, we're changes are not affected. Activity is really low and developing uh, neurons appear in mature. Brief periods of physiological stimuli trigger high levels of plasticity that they even exceed uh, those seen in young animals. Because if you remember the data I show you in young animals, you see an increase of 50%. But in Asian animals, you see a much larger increase, right? It is like 400%. So uh, these neurons are really plastic, and also the hippocampus is plastic enough to, uh, to hold this uh, amount of plasticity. So again, because you are uh, students, or you are uh, young and, and really uh, yeah, looking for, I don't know, what to do with your career or so on, I thought maybe I would give you a little piece of advice that I wish I, I, I would have gotten uh, when I was young. So dramatic. Uh, so first, I would say that uh, if you get into the adventure of doing science, uh, you should find a topic that you're passionate about. You, you have to really like it and keep an, an open mind. Be plastic and curious and very critical, especially with your own work. Like you have to be really accurate with what you say, say and be really thrilled with your uh, experiments. If you didn't find your passion yet, uh, you could read, go to talks addressing different topics. You never know what you will like. 
talk to people, ask a lot of questions, don't be shy, uh, ask me questions if, if you want, you can email me whatever you, you need. And uh, even if you don't pursue a career in neuroscience because I couldn't convince you, uh, you can still uh, find it all around you and uh, like, like, like I do every day. Um, so with that, I want to finish. I want to uh, thank uh, my people in my lab. This is uh, our amazing group leader, Alejandro Schindler. And this is all the amazing people. They are really fun to work with. You can follow us on, on Instagram if you want to. And also big thanks to Magali Herrero, which is a PhD student. And uh, we work together throughout these uh, Asian adventures. And I like it because some people think we are the same age. And that's not, yeah, that's crazy. But it makes me feel young. So yeah. Uh, and so thank you for your attention and I'm really ready for the questions.